in the early part of the 60s, I was living in a village in Alaska, in a wit village, and it, it was an amazing time of my life. I was learning so much about people and myself, and I had two children by then, and came back and we lived in North Minneapolis. And so I can't really tell you how this occurred, but my life started moving toward the West Bank um, in, in many ways. I loved going there. I liked to shop there. I liked to have tea, to eat the food. And then in, uh, it seems like it was in the 60s still when the Gutnick brothers, maybe it was the early mm -hmm. 70s, when uh, David and uh, Doug and a couple of other people had uh, above up where the Holzerman building, right next to where the Holzerman was, and you know the bank was down emerged a little bit down further, and there, uh, hundred flowers, uh, the magazine came out of there, Eddie Feline saying, you know, let a hundred flowers blossom. It was a very, that was a very appealing kind of thought in that time because people were really about just about exploring and, and trying new things. And so I, I liked that. And, and of course those were times when the Vietnam War was, was happening and turbulent times and people had firm ideas or were developing firm ideas one way or the other about that war and what it meant and concerned about the people who were going and uh, you know all the men my age were had a number and they you know it was either too high or too low and uh, so you know there was draft counseling was happening in Dinkytown John Martinson, who was a really good friend, Quaker friend, and uh, another guy, friend of his, started that operation, um, and and he uh, w w had been a friend for a number of years. He he and his wife Fran, and uh, he asked. He told me that there was a job because I was sort of looking for a part-time job at that point, and downtown that I could work for one of the attorneys who um, took the cases of, of uh, uh, people who were either uh, wanting to be conscientious objectors or to uh, perhaps they were resisting the war at all uh, or they didn't know and it was a whole exploration of things and so I found myself working for five years most part-time and full-time, but just mostly part-time. And um, Chester Bruvold was, was the name of the attorney, and he was a very good friend of Ken Tilson, who many people around here know. And, and they kind of networked a whole group of attorneys in the area who could help people who were really struggling with these big choices. And uh, so the and and I think maybe I ha I hadn't met David and Doug until about uh, probably 1970. In 1970, um, there were <laughs> there were so many things people were doing, and schools were one of them. And there was developing a free school um, on uh, the West Bank. Uh, in Dania Hall, and my friend Mary became my friend Mary Gutnick, and um, who who was a tremendous teacher, and uh, Sue Phoenix, who became also a very close friend, and she was a teacher in in the other world, <laughs> in the uh, ordinary work, world of schools, and she was drawn to this, and there were a number of people like that, and Doug Gutnick. Uh, taught at the school part of the time also. And there was just this 
I felt so discouraged about schools at the time, like where, you know, you had to sit down at this desk and everything was very regimented and it, and it didn't seem like, it, was, it seemed that something less formal, you know, I was reading A.S. Neal, um, my mother had been a reader of that uh, educational reformer of the 40s or 50s, I remember that stuff, but mostly it was just my own intuitive sense. And um, began talking to the superintendent of schools in Minneapolis and saying, you don't have a place for my children. So some of us, that was kind of a brave statement. Oh, he, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. He, uh, I think he might have uh, been the president of McAllister once. John and Davis. John Davis. No oh, what a, what a fixer, what a, what a guy, what a guy, you know. And he understood what we were saying, the parents who were speaking about this to him. That there were different modes and different ways of learning and some children would respond very well to differences in that. And so uh, he, uh, so we went ahead with this school and in some ways I just think it was sheer madness and I sometimes have prayed that my children would, would forgive me for such things. But, but no, generally it, it turned out quite well and they, uh, it was several years. Um, uh, it may have been a little bit into 1969, but they, uh, they, they went on lots of field trips and they even went to Madeline Island once, this whole big group of people and they were, they quote, discovered the little teeny tiny houses that were built in Madeline Island and um, explored that. It was just, you know, seeing their faces and telling the story of this architecture and the little people who would tell stories and all the things they were doing in this place. It just seemed like that was one of those moments. It seemed like that that was this is the right thing to do, and uh, and then they ended up not being able to be in Dania Hall. I think they were there one or two years in that uh, you know the building burned in I don't know what maybe the 80s or 90s I think very sad because it was such a historic connection to the community no matter what it was doing and. Uh, so, so I worked for the attorney and, and I was able to make the money to pay for the preschool and, and uh, by doing that and so this, this whole thing evolved and a lot of uh, experiences of, you know, that early part, a lot of people were hippies. I was never a hippie. I thought, you know, if I read about it, I thought I was kind of a counterculture person. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, I, I was real community oriented. In North Minneapolis, uh, my first husband and, and I both were really pretty, well, as much as I could be <laughs> with three young kids. But uh, our friends who lived upstairs in our duplex on the north side, they also, their children were in that school, and Dorothy Jacobs was one of the teachers of that, which was wonderful, because my children knew her, and I knew her. And, um, so, this whole kind of thing, I mean, I, I thought hippies did really great things. As Eddie Feline used to say, we went out to Georgetown, this little gathering on the other side of Minneapolis, and, we invented electricity, and then we uh, uh, we invented gardening, and, and Eddie always had such a great way of not taking himself too seriously. But those were just cherished times, you know, stopping at that place sometimes, and and I, and I, and I knew that was not my way of living or my way of doing stuff. But there was a lot of crossover and friendship between. Um, counterculture people and um, and uh, uh, hippies but I, just to kind of close here a little bit for you know and before we go on to other things John Davis 
Fisher called me up one day and he said, I think we are going to have a school for your children. I said, what? It was Saturday and I'm thinking, he's calling on Saturday to tell me this, what may be good news. And it, and it was, it was the beginning of Southeast Alternative Schools, so that was, you know, around the Dinkytown area. That was Marcy and Holmes, and then over more uh, toward Prospect Park, there was, you know, by the Witch's Castle, they said, uh, hat. <laughs> they, there was a school there, that was a kind of more mainstream educational experience. I can't remember what they called that, pro progressive or something. And one of my kids started kindergarten in that school and then uh, later, you know, went, went to the free school. And uh, I think, I, I, yeah, they started this whole system of schools and, and then they had a free school. My kids did not want a free school. They said, no, I want a little more structure than that. So, you know, they kind of went to other parts of it. Two of them went to Marcy, which was the open school, and they had classes where you would stay with your teacher for three years if you wanted to, which again was remarkable. And uh, uh, so I, I, I think, you know, I think that my, one of my sons is a teacher in uh, Florida, he works a lot with um, kids, youth, who uh, have court, um, you know, appointments. They, they have to go to a certain school and live there. It, it's like a detention. And it's, it's just remarkable to me the things that this group of teachers comes up with to connect with the kids about their education. And he says, oh, well, Jay Scoggins from Marcy, that, that was my model of a teacher. And then Bev Cotman, who taught at Marshall, Marshall University, which now is a kind of, uh, they closed it too bad. <laughs> but uh, he said they, they were my models for how to be a teacher. And uh, it, it came from that. So that was kind of how I got really more and more connected initially with the West Bank and also you, you couldn't really live on the West Bank and not be connected to Dinky Town and, you know, the, the people playing music on the street with their, uh, their instrument cover open and you could throw in coins or stop and talk. Yeah. Wow. Um, I must say, uh, this is, this battery is very temperamental, so we may at some point have to stop to change it. Okay, just, uh, that's fine. Just be aware that that'll happen. I'll try not to, I'll try to catch it, not in mid-sentence. Um, well, the thing that is coming up, I mean, there are lots of things to talk about, but one thing that's coming up here is this alliance we've seen over and over again between establishment, semi-establishment, <laughs> and <laughs> hippie hula hoopers, <laughs> and how, how basically cordial these relationships have been. Um, and I, I guess I, I wanted to really get straight about the story you told about alternative schools. Yeah. Now, if I'm getting it right, uh, first you founded this initial preschooly thing for, with your own money. No, no. That was not. That well, was not. Well, right. no, no, <laughs> no. Uh, well, I didn't found that school. The city huh. school it was yeah. called. I had. I was at the time uh, working. Uh, I had helped in 1969 to start the first federally funded child care program in North Minneapolis uh -huh. and there were that was really it became a countercultural or a multicultural school just an amazing group of people it was really an honor to be a part of that but this school was developed by a group of people Mary Gutnick and Sue Phoenix and Mike Walsh and Doug and uh, other people put this school together. It would be almost like, you know, it was a private school. 
and so you paid money. And they were, you know, sometimes I think they, it was really hard for them to deal with the finances of it because they were very generous and, you know, they made lots of bread and, <laughs> and uh, cooked the food there and taught the kids that style of cooking that was emerging, you know, like the co-op food. And uh, no, I meant I was able to, that's about what I, you know, made was an, enough to, to allow them to go to this school. And, um, you know, people would think of, you know, some fine or fancy school that they sent their kids to, but this was, this was our choice. And I think there were three free schools at that time in 1970 mm -hmm. that emerged. So then, how, how long did your, your kids attend that school? Yeah, I, I'm having trouble remembering the ending of that school. I think... Uh, probably about three years. Yeah. And was it then kind of seamless that at the end of that three year time you got the call from John Davis to say that yeah. he'd, he'd, he'd made a school for you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the us. southeast. And, yeah. and, and at that point, I mean you'd mentioned in the course of your discussion of, of education in the area you know, quite a number of schools. Yeah. Did they were did they all kind of then follow from that southeast one, or were they happening at the same time? They they opened at the same time. It was you know there was quests, and so there was federal money, and uh, you know there was this must have been uh, m more people than us <laughs> because you know we were maybe sixty at the tops, a hundred people. 100 families, in, uh, but we were noisy about it, and, uh, but I think, I think there was a lot of uh, writing, you know, people were writing about this, that wonderful man who wrote 36 children, I, I can't remember his name, but Herbert Cole, Herbert Cole, and he oh. was doing these wonderful experiments with children in, uh, gosh, I think it was Chicago, somewhere and he's just continued on doing so many things mm -hmm. like that but I think that there were things like this going on in other places that kind of you know how people hear about things and then they they try this well let's try this and, um, but yeah the schools were just regular ordinary schools and and the rest of the school system kept appeared to keep on going as it had before because not everyone thought this was a good idea and you know so and then there were some who well, well try this for a while i i have often thought it would be so fascinating to know uh i mean to follow up all of those people who were children at that time in the schools because my my uh, just intuitive look at it is that these are really some incredible people mm -hmm. you know they've gone on to to take many roles I think about uh, Amy Phoenix I think Amy Phoenix <laughs> runs half the university now I mean she she just she whatever she does, or maybe she's gone on to something else now. But she she's just she was in the free school, which was actually you know the the most experimental of all the schools. And and there were just there were other people who who went to um, that school, and then you know the the Marcy School I think was kind of the queen of the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, you oh such a collection of teachers. And uh, the, the principal, Glenn Enos, uh, was his name. And, um, you know, I, I moved to Minneapolis then in 19, I mean, to um, Cedar Riverside in 1975. I, I was, uh, my marriage was ending. And um, so I took the three children and moved to uh, uh, the West Bank, which was where I had friends, Dorothy Jacobs, Dorothy and Jim li lived across the alley, and Bruce and Lorna 
uh, Sullivan and, and Bruce Rubenstein. And, the, you know, these are people that I had met over the years or I knew was were friends with. So they were all kind of helping me to get established again. But this was then, then the kids got to go into these schools and I, I can't remember, I, I'd have to just think about that because I can't remember exactly the sequence of things. But it, it seemed to just kind of roll along naturally, what you asked. And uh, it just, it was, it was our life then, thinking about new possibilities. It was kind of a, I think in some ways it was a very democratic, very experimental age and time um, that uh, that was happening and some people were very offended by it so you had conflict in the culture about it you know the, and then the ideas about the war which actually you know I mean since that time the sad story of of um, you know our Secretary of Defense at the time uh, later saying we shouldn't have been there it was a mistake and it's, that's to me so tragic to think of the people who served there and and gave so much of themselves thinking that this was you know what needed to happen and for someone to come out later and say we knew that was the wrong idea that's really tragic that is so sad. But anyway, we were <laughs> we were going forward, and I I uh, I came I came to the West Bank uh, the very month that the lawsuit about the big high-rise apartment buildings, the Heller Heller Siegel uh, issue, was aired in court, and the neighborhood won. And the neighborhood said that it was not healthy for children to have, you know, we're a rural, rural city, right? And so, you know, it's not right to have children so far away from their parents, way up high in a high rise, and what if the kids are down below? That was one thing. Another thing they used, I remember, was sound. And then pollution was, of course, another thing. And the plan was that the entire community from, um, well, you know, the, the freeway ran through down below, and then there was the firehouse theater, and what became the coil center was, you know, there, there always was a settlement house there in that community. And... Um, You know, the, uh, just the, the way uh, that things evolved about, um, I kind of lost my track there, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, well, the, the, the community wanted it to end, this big, this high rise, you know, and, and uh, Cedar Riverside was a quaint, tiny little space in life, you know, had these unusual shops where people made their own jewelry and I think I think maybe that was sometime in there was about the time I met Nor. Nor Hall was uh, in that neighborhood too and that was just a wonderful experience. I was I was in school at Metro State and she was on faculty there. Um, and that was like a group of women in that school. I think they just saved my life, I think about it. Um, since then, you know, that I, I was able to finish school and, and, uh, and get my BA. I had stopped school when I was a sophomore. And um, so that was very big. We, we ended up in the middle of the rent strike that was going on about this time. You know, it wasn't just the settling of what was going to be built. It was this strike about rents and, and they wanted, you know, the owners wanted to charge me 40% increase in rent and the, and the, and the, um, and the tenants union said, no, we, we can't allow that. 
in the neighborhood. You're, you're going to live here and you're going to stay here. And we're going to negotiate about the rent, but it's not going to be a 40% increase. We're just not doing that. So here, you know, I took my children in this. It was just a lovely place on the West Bank by uh, Riverside Park. And actually, I had lived in the 60s, the early 60s. I had lived close to that area. And I used to walk along that street on 6th Street and knock on doors and ask if they knew of anyone who was considering going to be moving <laughs> because I wanted to, us to live on that block. Mm -hmm. And here it happened. Right facing the park was uh, um, this house, this amazing house. Uh, so many people have lived in that house. Jonah, who did Jonah and the Whale, and the Torstens and girls. Uh, um, Ruth Ann was married to John Beach at that time, who played for Willie and the Bees, the, you know, Willie Murphy's. Um, group and you know it was it was a real cl a cluster of uh, uh, artists and musicians and they were all working in the co-ops or you know it was a really uh, big kind of a you know changes in way of life one big one for me was it was so exciting the other day I saw my my granddaughter was showing me she'd gone away to school and she was uh, had to learn Tai Chi mm -hmm. and she said I heard you did Tai Chi grandma and I said I, I really did uh, <laughs> Ann Waterhouse who ran the Community Development Foundation on the West Bank Ann came up to me and she was really interested in storytelling because that's I was doing storytelling and I that was my big thing. Oh, and she wanted to talk about whatever it was. And one day she brought on uh, Frankie Sai and a couple of other people and they said, we want to do Tai Chi and we want to start a little group so we can study together and we can practice in the park. And Riverside Park was just, it's such a lovely park, you know, this green expanse of grass. And I was a really rural person. I didn't, I didn't get parks until I'd been in the city for four or five years. But here was this incredible park that had been sculpted out by early leaders in Minneapolis. And it was so beautiful trees, oak trees. and um, So we went and practiced in the park a lot. And I had this... Um, uh, kind of a porch, a screen porch on this duplex that I was living in, or triplex or whatever it was. Um, and uh, I got up almost, oh, especially summer, spring, and fall. I was up every morning early, and then my kids were still sleeping, so this was my time, and I'd go across the street into the park and practice, do my my Tai Chi and I, it, it was so fun because I was doing the Tai Chi with my granddaughter and she it was the same form mm -hmm. just the same form and and uh, I did it um, every day for seven years and I don't know why I stopped but you know those are the kinds of things I think I think uh, I, I, I got a job uh, when I had come there. That was the other thing that I think that helped me to make make new friends and it was uh, uh, being one of the coordinators at the Cedar Riverside People's Center and and that's another just <laughs> miraculous thing. I mean we trudged along and, and with a lot of support made some really wonderful things start and and kept things going. The North Country Co-op started in the waiting room of the, of the clinic and we had medical students from the university and uh, residents who came and supervised and we had volunteer um, pharmacists and counselors and it, it was really, we had 70 volunteers and two, most of the time it was two coordinators, and for a while we had three. Um, we we uh, coordinated that, just the, 
two of us, you know, 70 volunteers is a big group. And, you know, because people, people's time changes and they can't, oh, I can't make it in tonight and there you are. And you're thinking, oh, I got to find somebody else. You know, you come up with these great ideas. So that was where Ann Waterhouse had her office close to there. And, and I got to, got to do things with her. And of course, Steve and, and Joyce, um, Joyce Yu and Steve Parliament were uh, working a lot in the neighborhood. And I knew them before I moved to the West Bank. I knew them probably in the early 70s. And, uh, but this, uh, the community, when I think back about it now, you know, people talk so much about loneliness and how hard it is to get to know people. And um, especially people, you know, in 20s and 30s, and I, I think about, there was something different <laughs> about this community at that time. There was, there was an openness, in a way, it kind of, I, I lived in Alaska for a few years as a child, and that kind of frontier uh, hmm. mentality, way of being, way of uh, connecting with people, was was like it was on the West Bank. I mean, I felt, I felt just really, oh, I felt so much support, even though I had to go to court with the tenants union and I lost, but nobody wanted to make me leave because I was, you know, I had three children and who would want to come in the winter time and ask me to leave and nobody did, so they worked it out. And, and but <laughs> it was at times kind of stressful. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and, and the kids, you know, that park was, Riverside Park's just an enormous park, and for a while they had a park worker, which was amazing, and he'd come out to get the kids, come on, we're going to play volleyball, or we have to do, we have to do baseball today, or whatever it was, and it was, oh, the summer, that summer when that park worker was there, and I think that was probably about 76 or 77. It was just like a miracle, because all these kids had something to do every day, and he was a good coach with sports, and he was friendly, and, you know, it was, it was very, very fine, and uh, I think, I think, uh, I, I've heard people talk about trying to build intentional community that was something like that, you know. It's like um, there was a closeness, you know, with the people in the community and the, the medical clinic. It, it's very interesting because it was not only a volunteer clinic that, you know, cared about people's health. And uh, we didn't have any uh, programs for drug overuse or overdose, but but there were other people that were working on the streets about that, and um, we were really aware of it, you know. And and most of the people that we saw were in their, you know, twenties or thirties, or you know, they were they were younger. And uh, but this this was a. This was a really important thing for people, you know, to help kids that run away from school and or from home and go go to the city, you know, and come to the West Bank and oh no, these kids are really alone and out there and you know they're really that's a very risky thing. And, um, and Phil Richter had a drugstore there, and Phil Phil could talk to young people in ways most people could never touch be in that. You know, he'd he'd say, Well, how long has it been since you called your mom? And or he'd say, you know, I, I'm I'm kinda worried about those kids you've been hanging around with. I don't I don't think they're that's very good for you, you know? And he'd get up talking about these things about their lives, you know, he was like a street worker, or mm -hmm. social worker or something. And, um, you know, that was, that was actually, that was, he, he had his drugstore down in Dania Hall, just downstairs from the city school. So we got to know him through 
through that too. But you know, that was, uh, and, and then the people down at the Riverside Cafe, you know, they made all this wonderful food, <laughs> roots and grains and, you know, people were, you, if you look at where food is today in this country, you know that the people who started the co-ops, the food co-ops and these natural food restaurants, though food preferences have changed quite a bit, they've changed a lot into the direction of the people who, you know, who did that. Yeah, that was amazing. So, I mean, you, you focused on the community you lived in and the institutions and people that made your life agreeable over yeah. this whole time. Yeah. And I guess the, the piece I'm, I'm missing in your account is what was happening to you through all this. So uh, when, when we left our heroine last, she was working at a, a law office, uh, helping to uh, help, helping draft resistors and people in various kinds of trouble with draft boards. So how, what's your story yeah. in all this? Well, that, that, those were amazing times because that was the women's movement uh, starting in the 60s. You know, I started reading Betty Friedan and the Feminine Mystique, and, and a lot of meeting Nora was really very important to the changes that I was going through. Going to school, uh, being able to do that, Metro State started, and that was a very experimental school when it started, too, as a college or university. And um, so my, my study there, they didn't have majors and minors then, but my study was mainly um, storytelling and then how, um, let's see, what was it, uh, ways, ways of using story, it was almost like uh, uh, soft advertising because I had worked with nonprofits both in North Minneapolis and then in City of Riverside and I saw how people could sometimes be doing wonderful work and they, they weren't good at telling about it so other people wouldn't know and sometimes the, the, the ones that were not as good would would uh, be more successful with getting resources and funds and uh, what they needed to work. So mm -hmm. I was interested in that, but it was mostly, I was very interested in storytelling. I, I, I had, you know, read to my children all the time, and then I started to see that if I told them a story, you know, where you, you could look at their faces and they'd look at you, and you move your hands and move around, that there was something more magical that happened with that and, and uh, powerful, powerful thing. And so I was, I was performing more and more. There was, there was a local group called the Storyfront uh, that started in Whittier Park, not far <clears throat> from the West Bank and, um, and uh, Dinky Down area. And uh, we met I'm sure we met once a month. There were probably eight, eight or six or eight of us who kind of carried that in the early times. And um, uh, that, so that was support for each other because that was kind of, you know, no, well, I certainly didn't think of, I didn't know whether uh, that would be a vocation or not. Ann Waterhouse used to say, well, Jackie Torrance makes like forty thousand dollars a year that was a lot of money in those days and Jackie Torrance was an African-American woman from I'm not sure where it was Georgia or Tennessee I mean she was just one of the most remarkable people in that time and they there was a national storytelling center that started in Jonesboro Tennessee 
and Jackie was always there. But there were there was a whole collection of people people who were encouraging this art form. I remember once seeing an article in New Age magazine. Um, um, Connie and Barbara, I think of their last names, so they told a lot of tandem stories. And they had been uh, somewhere where people proclaimed that they were starting the National Storytelling Organization, you know. And so there was just another one of those things um, that was happening. And uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly why. I seem to gravitate to doing work, and this was what was important. I was finding vocation, and I was finding how would that work with who I was and what I wanted, and ended up um, my last, uh, well, what do I think? Oh, I, then I started at St. Mary's, which I, I took three years off after I went through, you know, Metro State and graduated. I took three years off because I, I really needed rest and I needed to re <laughs> just be with my kids more for a time, you know. And so it was that. It was that balance between working and vocation and, and the needs of the children and um, and I really was so glad that I did that, you know, that I took that time because I, I got to know them again much better and, you know, showed them some of the things that I was doing. Um, one of the things at Metro State that, you know, living in the city like that, I got an opportunity to come, you know, the architects who built the uh, Native American Center on Franklin Avenue, just right next to Cedar Riverside. Um, I found out from the Art Institute that they were having a lunch and they had invited two uh, Arapaho holy men to come and tell the story of the ghost dance. And, you know, I was finding out the ghost dance was what terrified the cavalry at Wounded Knee and caused that horrible um, massacre, that horrible thing that happened there. But here were these these tre people who collected these stories for so many years. And I was, I got invited to come <laughs> to this lunch. And I had my little rinky-dink um, video camera. I had learned video with a women's film collective, about, which was over in Dinkytown, actually. That's where we met for several years, and Meridil Lesseur was our mentor and would come. And and we, at Rarig Center, you know, uh, I, I went there a lot, and I checked out their videos and, and reel-to-reel video, you know, when you wanted to edit something, you had to roll it around with your fingers. But, you know, that's what we were doing. And, and the women were making really, we were making interesting uh, video about our experiences as women. You know, the, I remember a poem, um, Fran, oh, Gramercy was the last name of the poet. And, and it was all about waiting. <laughs> waiting to be born, waiting to go to school, waiting, and, and the experience of women is always waiting for somebody else to do something, you know, before you could be who you were or do what you uh, were supposed to do for your heart and your soul. And uh, I just, oh, that was a wonderful experience. Um, those women are still, you know, connected in my life. I not every day kind of close, but I mean, I, it's just an unspoken, amazing thing to uh, be back with them. And and uh, so here I was. Um, I got getting. I was trying to make a videotape of storytellers for my final project at Metro State. And <laughs> I taped Meridel. And I taped my youngest son, Michael, and his friend across the alley, Annie, Annie Jacobs, 
and they they told stories all the time and this is what I was sort of trying to get at that there were many different kinds of storytelling and so um, the, I was doing pieces of that and I was out um, you know doing poetry of Padeus uh, Commerce. I am. Oh, I can't think of the last name now. He was an Irish poet, and he talked about stories as being like shards of glass that are in the ground. And I was out on my neighbor's morning glories, you know, just uh, in these little white spring flowers, before the kids got up, videotaping these these uh, shards and the the mm. ground and everything to to just have a background for that piece of poetry and he Padreus 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 column Padreus column that was mm -hmm. it and he and and that poem really inspired me so I was doing that and then I was trying to find out uh, I wanted a building and what the architects well when they brought people together they so I I had them, they, they gave me a room. I This was just such an amazing experience. They let me set up my camera in, in the room and then they came in one at a time and they'd tell their part of the story. And one part of that building, uh, you know, uh, Morrison, uh, oh, an incredible sculptor, um, our uh, wood sculptor, who, who did the, um, the, sculpture on the front of the um, Native American Center was, uh, he was there that day too. And then there was uh, uh, one of the architects said, you know, when we started to build and we were planning the building, we weren't going to put windows in the front, you know, because there was a trend going on in schools even, you know, where you'd, you, you'd cover up all the window space because it might get broken. And, um, and one of the elders, he said, came to a meeting there and he said, we can't live in a building that has no eyes. We have to be able to see the world and have the world see us. So they built that building. I've never heard of glass being broken in that building. It'd be hard to imagine there wasn't some. But I mean, it, it was it was meant to be there, and and it came from the decision of the people who, you know, who were in that community and were needed that building for the art and the work that they were doing, the community work. Well. So all of these things got taped, and then and then the uh, Arapaho holy man told the story of the ghost dance, which I'd sort of read about, but I didn't really know. But hearing them tell it was, oh my goodness, I was just so so impressed with their strength and their courage, and and the way they carried a story. It was just something. So wonderful. So then, Bob Rosebear, a lot of people knew Bob. He was a jeweler and he worked at the Native American Center. And it was already built, you know, then, at that time. And so they said, well, the, the holy men were going to tell the story um, up in, upstairs in some room uh, at the Native American Center. And um, Bob said, well, I'll have my camera there, and you just bring yours, and you can, you can tape them, too. We'll both tape. I could barely sleep. I'm thinking, who am I going over to, to tape these amazing people that I'm not even very good at? I don't even know hardly about video. Right? And, but, okay, I got it all in the car, put it in the trunk, went over there and then I got there and I thought, well, I'll just leave it in the trunk and maybe they won't need it or something. You know, I don't want to bring it all in. I came in and the, the building was just filled with people who were looking at the art and there were, there was a sand, Navajo sand painter there and they were 
gathered in this circle around him and I'm kind of gazing at what's happening and not really noticing that I'm sort of late getting there. And here comes Bob down the stairs and he says, where's your video equipment? And I, I said, well, yeah, well, it's in the car. Mine doesn't work today and we have to have yours. Oh, no, okay, okay, okay. So we went out to the car, we got all the video equipment and we're starting off. He says, you're going to tape this now because this is your equipment. And I said, no, no, I, I just don't think that's a good idea. No, would you tape? No, not going to do it. It's, no, it's you, you, you need to do this. And we, I didn't say any more, but we got up there and, and the, two storytellers were ready to go and I said, please Bob, I really think that for this one time you you should just use the equipment and do this. So he taped it. And and I I still have I still have on real to real this the story of the of the uh, holy man telling those telling that story. And uh so you asked, well, that was what was happening to me. Sometimes it was hard to believe the things that would just happen. You know, the person who'd come along or know something about something or, or a counselor at school would say, well, I, 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 have you thought about this? And, you know, you could, you could try this. And it seemed to me that all the things that I'd been doing in my life that far were kind of coming together in in what and what it seemed where it was going is into some form of healing work and because uh, I was really impressed with the work of Native American healers and I didn't want to be some kind of joker you know who say oh now I'm going to be a healer like a Native American healer and run around and talk about things I didn't know anything about, you know, so I knew that, no, it was like one thing I saw was that there needed to be, in the Navajo stories, there was a circle. There was a story and the myth and the person who needed the myth and, that, but that circle around the people was so important. And, uh, but I was then three, you know, after I stopped going to school then, I, for three years, I decided to go to St. Mary's. And uh, I was, uh, had a graduate program there. And, you know, when you go to that kind of program where you're getting training for, to be um, psycho a psychologist or social worker or whatever, usually you have to find your own internship <laughs> your place to find out what you're going to do and I feel so compassionate about people who when I hear they're doing that because it, it, it just feels like such a big problem that you wonder how, how am I ever going to do this and then one of the storytellers had um, talked to Larry, Larry Johnson who later we we married um, many some years later from that, but he was uh, he had developed the uh, children's TV network at Children's Hospital, and uh, with a puppet and a security camera, and but they had by then they had really nice stuff and they'd go up in the rooms and talk to the kids and they'd bring down kids' toys, animals, and they'd talk on the, you know, they'd have an interview with Porky Chops, this pig puppet, and, and Tyler, the angleworm, and, uh, <laughs> they, you know, it was a really rich kind of place, and, and uh, it, w it was really exciting to me to be there, because I, I was working for the um, Karen Olness, who was a director of health, education. She was a physician who was in the early days of that mind-body, uh, endocrinology, you know, all of those things pulling together into one kind of way of working. And she, she was learning from people who were pioneers in that field. And uh, her, her assistant, uh, Dan Cohen, also was. And, you know, they just, 
they got what I was thinking. You know, that was what was so amazing about it. They loved stories, and um, Dan had lived in Navajo country for some years doing, uh, you know, internship as a doc, and, and she just had traveled a lot of places in the world, and especially places where, you know, there was a lot of poverty and difficulty, challenges. Uh, and I've, I've worked off and on with her for, for many years with Karn because, you know, it, it's just, she's, she's really an amazing uh, woman. She, she, she really has been a leader in the whole area of making space for people to learn how to take care of disasters with children and families. And we have, oh boy, we're still trying to get something together, even even at this point in life. And I, I made a story out of um, my early days um, that she used in the classes. I used to go out to Cleveland and tell it and have a group of people. And, and she always said that it was a very important story and it, it was about loss. And uh, she said, what's so good about it is that the people who are going to volunteer often don't know what kind of emotional resources they're going to need to do this and to not be surprised that they will be asked to go into places that are very challenging with the people that are going through big disasters and and uh, children, you know, losing children. and So, um, that was going there to Children's Hospital, you know, and the director there, Arnie Anderson, oh, he, he practically started the hospital, really, and, and he, he uh, once served in, I think, a refugee camp where they, they did marches with big puppets and, and taught health concepts by these big puppets and nur like nursing of babies instead of using uh, formula and that kind of stuff. They, they made that happen with, with puppets. So I, I got to one day go and to have an interview with, with Arnie Anderson. What a great human being mm -hmm. also. His family is just all, you know, some of the family started the puppet show. The, Heart of the Beast, you know, involved in that. But anyway, uh, the go, you know, I was learning. Um, we called it relaxation elementary or self hypnosis. I I was taping a lot of kids, kids with um, hemophilia, who said they were able to slow down the flow of their blood using relaxation and a kind of internal imagery. And that's the kind of work that we were doing there. And, uh, and I made a story for Kids with Cancer. Um, and that, that was really uh, the, hardest, <laughs> the hardest work, you know, because the, I call those kids the Ascended Masters because they were so, they were so brave and had grown up way faster than anyone should ever grow up or have to. But they, they followed the challenge and some, you know, in some days they'd be having really bad days. And one day I remember just going home. I, I just left, I was supposed to be around and I went home and I told my boss, I said, I, I just couldn't, couldn't be there anymore. And, you know, but it was, it was a turning point, you know, it was learning how to listen and be with someone without having to be them. And that's, that's really a big lesson, lesson one, if, if you're really going to meaningfully help someone. And, uh.